No matter where in the world you live, your life is affected by the ocean. But many of our oceans are sick and have been so for a while. So what's keeping them from bouncing back to full health? Well, it's partly down to not agreeing on what a healthy ocean actually looks like. That makes it hard to settle on the best course of action. But things might be changing. New science-based tools like the Ocean Health Index offer comprehensive assessments of the social, economic and environmental conditions of an ocean. Today we will talk to Professor Ben Halpin from the University of California, Santa Barbara, who is the creator of the Ocean Health Index, and Torsten Blenkner, a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, who with his team has developed a spin-off called the Baltic Health Index. Together we will explore what it takes to restore an ocean to a good health, and to what extent these new assessments can help us to reach our goals. My name is Susan Iranen, and you are listening to Rethink Talks. First of all, Ben and Torsten, welcome to our podcast. Let me start off with an easy question to both of you. Why should we care about our oceans? Um, you know, the oceans provide us so much uh, as people on this planet. They provide us food, the oxygen we breathe, livelihoods. So many people work in and around the oceans. Um, economic value, people have estimated the, the oceans, if they were a country, would be the seventh largest economy in the world. We, we go for tours and recreation at the, at the coasts and oceans. And of course, so much of our cultural identity for anyone who lives near the, the ocean and uh, comes from the ocean. So there's just so much that we get from the oceans. And because of that, so much we, we need to care about and, and help keep the oceans healthy and sustainable. That was already quite a bit, but I think, Torsten, you, you still have something to add. Yeah, I com completely agree with Ben. It's just a fantastic system, and we are so much interconnected, the human and ocean. So I think it's um, just a fantastic place, so we need to really need to care about them. So, so based on your expertise, then, uh, what is a healthy ocean? Uh, Torsten, do you want to go first? Ooh, the first, uh, the difficult question first. Um, yeah, healthy ocean... Um, There are lots of different definitions about a healthy ocean, and that very much depends on whom you're asking. But I, I would say a healthy ocean is that um, provides a lot of benefits to the human society. So uh, there's lots of um, biodiversity, uh, a lot of different species in, in the water that providing providing partly also food and, and so on to the uh, to the human society. Or oh, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, when I first started down the path of thinking about how to think about and measure a healthy ocean. I, I myself, and certainly a lot of the people I was talking with thought about it as, you know, it's a pristine ocean, like a healthy ocean is one that is without any human impact, it's nature in its full glory. But as I started looking into it, you just read so much more about how governments and how people and how conservation groups think about what a healthy ocean is. And it's about, people being part of the ocean. And so you can't have a healthy ocean if you don't have people part of it and enjoying it and benefiting from it. And so it really is about that connection between people and nature and the sustainable interaction between them is really what makes for a healthy ocean. If nature isn't there, it's not healthy, but also if people aren't there, it's it's not healthy. So, so how do you see it then? Um, do you think there's some kind of consensus about What does a healthy ocean look like? Uh, and uh, and if not, why, why do you think that is so? I think there is consensus in the idea that these many things that are part of how people interact with the ocean matter. So I think people agree that if we can have healthy fish stocks, if we can have healthy coastal tourism, if we can have healthy biodiversity, if we can have healthy coastlines that are protecting themselves and our Our property behind them. People agree that those are the things that matter. I think where the, the lack of consensus may be or may lie is how important any one of those things is compared to the other. So some people are going to care more about 
the fisheries than they are about biodiversity and vice versa. There's going to be other people who care more about the biodiversity than the fishing. And so figuring out how to balance those different interests and those different values for what people want from the ocean is where there, I think, is still challenge in thinking about um, both measuring the health of the ocean, but also managing it for um, a sustainable state that meets everyone's interests and needs for, for a healthy ocean. Yeah, I I, uh, I completely agree. And I think it's uh, besides maybe the value is also where do you put the level to if what's which kind of uh, what's biodiversity level uh, you need for a healthy ocean or which contaminants level and so on. I think that's also one a bit uh, maybe uh, where some not so much agreement is on. Uh, I think that's a, com completely agree with Ben. There's a large agreement with the we need a healthy ocean and we need these components. But then sometimes there might be different perceptions on um, which levels we need for that. that. Yeah, that's such a great point, Thorsten. I'm really glad you brought it up because it's it is one of the things that we found in studying this that is uh, the most important to clarify and sometimes the most difficult to get consensus on is what is our target for any one of these different objectives? Right. And so, you know, how many fish do you actually want to leave in the sea versus harvest eat? How many species do you want to make sure are protected versus allowed to maybe become threatened by extinction? How many jobs do you want to make sure are there in coastal areas? These are all really important questions and and people have very different views on that uh, and those differences can translate into very different types of actions or policies that you might take or even views of how healthy an ocean is it's yeah it's really a fundamental part of it and probably where some of the biggest disagreement still lies in terms of what we are trying to achieve with healthy oceans so so before we go into any more details uh, Ben could you tell us about the story behind the Ocean Health Index? Uh, it has become quite a widely applied approach to measure ocean health nowadays. Um, what is it about? Uh, about 12, 13 years ago now, so a while ago, um, a bunch of folks, myself included, were trying to think through how do you measure whether you've achieved a healthy ocean? This is what we're talking about right here. And can we do it in a way that isn't a jumble of hundreds of different types of data, pieces of information. Can we get it boiled down to something that's manageable to measure and, and easy to communicate to people? And so in that process, we looked across all sorts of policy documents and scientific literature and convened experts to figure out what it is that is most important and if possible, universally valued about healthy oceans. And that's how we came up with Ocean Health Index. So we have, uh, in the case of the global assessment, 10 goals or things that people care about and methods for measuring those uh, indicators that tell us how we're doing. And it was really this quest to try to come up with a simple tool that captures the complexity of ocean systems and our interactions with them in a way that is easy to communicate and share with the public, policymakers and scientists was, was really what motivated us to do it. And... Um... Maybe you can say a couple of words. Uh, what goals do you do you include uh, as an example? And uh, maybe what oceans have you applied the index on so far? Yeah, so uh, like I said, there are 10 of the goals that we um, focused on for the global assessment. We weren't aiming for 10. It just happened to be what um, emerged from the, the synthesis that we did. But these are things like food provision from wild-caught fisheries or aquaculture or healthy biodiversity from species and habitats, carbon storage to help mitigate against climate change, um, livelihoods and economies, this is an important role that coastal um, economies play and the way that people interact with the oceans, tourism and recreation, uh, cultural identity that comes from sense of place and so on. So it's not just conservation goals by any means, it's goals about how people interact with and benefit from the ocean and how we make sure those are pursued in a sustainable way. So that's what we did at the global assessment, but by design, the framework is flexible to any particular location, both in what are the things that people care about and how do you measure them and what data are available. So a particular location may only have nine goals or it might have 12 goals, depending on what people think is most important for a particular place. 
And we've now applied this framework in, in regional and local cases, we call them OHI plus for Ocean Health Index plus um, case studies in upwards of 30 different regions around the world and every single continent, including Antarctica, um, and from scales in quite small and like a, a regional um, bay or estuary all the way up to entire ocean systems. And so it's really flexible to the location and exciting to see it play out in all sorts of places around the world. So it's, it really seems like you've got the entire ocean pretty much covered. Um, well, <laughs> there's always more to do, but yeah, we're trying to help wherever we can for sure. Yeah. Um, and if you could mention maybe one or two key findings. You've done this for many years now. You have many systems you worked with, as well as the global assessment. Could you pinpoint one or two main findings from, from your research? Um, yeah, I think one of the most exciting things that comes from both the global assessment, which we've done for nine years now, and a regional assessment that we did in um, British Columbia province on the west coast of Canada, where we looked at 15 years of assessment, is the ability to look at how things have changed over time and where particular actions are making a difference in changing the health of the oceans. And so we see trends uh, in general, things are getting slightly better, but slowly um, when you look at the overall score, but when you dive into what's happening in particular places, for example, you can see the really important role that the, the accelerated pace of creating marine protected areas around the world in the last decade has really started to pay dividends in helping manage our oceans, protect biodiversity, um, and help um, protect the places that give cultural identity and sense of place to people along coasts. So we are seeing upticks in the scores related to those particular goals that people have for the oceans in response to the creation of the marine protected areas that are happening all around the world, from the small ones to the very, very large ones that have been created. So that's just one example of how we can see actions that have been taken translate into improved ocean health index scores that we can see as we track things over time. Thanks. So if we then take a deep dive into one of the regional assessments, uh, Torsten, in 2020, uh, what I also understand was uh, after quite a few years of work on it, uh, you launched the Baltic Health Index, which is a regional application of the Ocean Health Index. Uh, why do you see this was needed for the Baltic Sea, which is quite a well-studied system to begin with? Yeah, um, so so um, it started it started actually with the the fact that um, I, I was running a, a, as a network coordinator a larger project at Stockholm University from a lot of different disciplines and so on, and we wanted to do something with the Baltic. Then I saw Ben's publication in 2012, and so um, so I went over to California and had a meeting, uh, quite a nice coffee break actually, Ben. Uh, where we discuss if we can, uh, if there would be a possibility to apply the um, the OHI to the Baltic Sea. So um, we gathered some uh, international experts around the Baltic Sea, and also a crew of Ben came in in 2014, presented the possibility of a, of the Baltic Health Index using this Ocean Health Index framework, and there was a lot of positive support. In particular, because it's um, it's these the ocean with a kind of a social ecological system. So it uh, has a human perspective in it. And there has been in the Baltic with lots of data, a lot of assessment based from a conservation point of view. But the, uh, we wanted to have a, a comprehensive uh, assessment using the OSI framework for the Baltic to include also other goals as, as Ben already mentioned earlier, like um, the tourism, the livelihood economies, uh, carbon storage and so on. So. So after some years and back and forth, and I need to mention also this, which is also a great achievement with the uh, OHI, it's an open science tool. So we're using that a lot in, in our discussions with all the experts uh, to constantly improving the goals, how do we calculate the different, um, different goals and so on using this open science tool. So over six years, actually, we developed that now. And in 2020, we published that um, an online tool to present uh, all these um, these results. And and as I understand, that tool is available for everybody to go and take a look. Yeah, uh, uh, exactly. So it's an, it's an open science tool, and we had um, 
a great team here. They put the, everything on the on the web where everybody can go in there and also give even feedback on different goals, see how things have been calculated, why they have been calculated, and so on. Even the code is there and so on. So it's a fully transparent process. And and you mentioned already the experts. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit. Uh, who are they? And also, who are the ones who who would be the target group for using this kind of index in the Baltic Sea? Right. Uh, as we if we start a bit in the beginning of our discussion, we we said something: the value of each goal is quite important, but also the target level. So. So we started in the beginning of the process of the VHI to invite already quite a diverse group of people, experts for each goals, like experts in notification, experts in fishing, experts in biodiversity conservation, but also economists and so on. And uh, it became very clear that um, each expert has a different vision of where this target should be and how important certain things are. So over this long-term process, over six years, it was actually a very, very useful process with all the different experts and also NGOs, actually management agencies, to define what's actually our common vision for the Baltic Sea. What's uh, a common a common healthy Baltic Sea looks like and which kind of benefits can we get from that? So that was a very useful process. Uh, it's, it's not addressed in any of these publications and so on, but I think we learned during this process uh, a lot about that. And and I ask you the same question that I asked uh, Ben earlier. What do you think was the major finding of, of your work with the Baltic Health Index? Yeah, so in the beginning we had actually no idea. There were a lot of uh, sometimes actually quite pessimistic assessments earlier. Um, so. So we had, uh, and also similar as Ben, is we use it as a purely data-driven approach. So we didn't want to put any narratives or any any things on it. So like this needs to be bad or this needs to be good. So we use it's a purely data-driven approach. And um, so uh, what turned out to be good is actually quite some in the areas uh, along the uh, the coastline, the other the coast of fishing is actually a positive sign there. But then uh, we had some uh, challenges also and which that are, um, for example, marine protected areas that there are quite some in the Baltic, but for lots of them, we don't have any management plan implemented yet. And another one, uh, which is actually quite tricky to uh, assess is carbon storage because um, Carbon storage is quite an important goal, in particular now also in these uh, climate discussions. How much actually can the ocean store carbon and take away from the atmosphere? And therefore, that goal is we're still working on that um, intensively. But as a large assessment, it didn't show um, so good results yet. So. so, how then the Ocean Health Index, for example, in practice, how how can that be used or has been used already to manage our oceans? Yeah, I mean, I think there's at least three ways that it can can be used and has been used. I mean, the first is just awareness. It's a, I think it's a really powerful communication tool for helping understand what is otherwise a lot of complexity across all these different data sets and issues and goals and things that people care about. So the general public, policymakers, even scientists can use it as a way to, to just understand how things are going in the health of the ocean. And then the second is uh, for scientists in particular to help figure out what we know and don't know. Where are there opportunities to improve our understanding through better research, better data, um, to help um, improve the accuracy of, uh, of the Ocean Health Index. And then the third is really to help guide policy decisions. Like where are the most important and strategic places and things to do to act to improve the health of the ocean. And this is really where policymakers or conservation NGOs or others that are interested in trying to influence how we manage the oceans can use the index to guide their thinking. So for example, uh, in the uh, Northeast of the United States in the Gulf of Maine, we worked with the regional planning body there to incorporate the index into the development of their ocean plan. Like what kinds of uses are they gonna allow in that part of the world in the ocean? And then how are they going to assess the, the impact and the benefit of those actions? And so the index was applied there to tell them what the state of the ocean is and how that can guide their planning and thinking about allocation of actions. 
And then as they move forward, they'll repeat the assessment to track progress towards achieving those goals. So there's an example of a really policy focused use of the index to measure status, guide action, and then track progress towards healthy oceans. And if we look into the Baltic Sea, then, uh, how do you, Torsten, see that uh, the Baltic Health Index could be used in in practice? Yeah, so it, it can be used in, in different ways. So uh, at the moment, we we had it over the entire Baltic Sea, but in 42 units. And um, so we presented as a, a whole Baltic Sea assessment with different basins. And uh, this is uh, complementary to the uh, great work from um, Helcom, for example, doing the holistic assessment also for the entire Baltic Sea. And can I can I quickly ask uh, Helcom? Uh, oh, sorry, it's the Helsinki Convention. It's an international body who is imp- uh, important for the uh, management of the Baltic Sea and also uh, in relation to the European Union. So it brings all the parties together to manage the, the Baltic Sea. So, uh, but... But for the Baltic Health Index, what we uh, because it can be tailored also as, uh, as Ben said, so it can be used for smaller units. And um, so at the moment we have discussions with, uh, with people from uh, Stockholm region and also from uh, areas in, close to Helsinki in Finland and also in Germany uh, to apply the, uh, the Baltic Health Index to a smaller region. So using the data, using the knowledge from uh, different stakeholders in that region, and then also defining the goals based on them. So, um, so the idea there is really to have that very really operational, so that we uh, can then be calculated. And then when there are restorations in certain areas been doing, for example, in the Stockholm region, or then they could actually measure over time the progress of the improving the, the health as a comprehensive measure uh, and not only on, for example, biodiversity or the fishing or so on. So, so therefore, we're really uh, hoping that for the future that the um, body health index can be used in such um, smaller regions or, or local base and so on to inform management. Maybe we go back to the more large scale uh... Uh, large-scale issues, what has to do with the oceans. And uh, Ben, we have just entered the UN decade of ocean science. Uh, What do you see would be a realistic hope uh, for us to have the healthy oceans globally um, by 2030 when the decade is uh, about to finish? I I actually have quite a lot of hope because of the attention that is being given to them, but also... uh, You know, the oceans are really resilient if we give them a chance, in part because we don't live in them. If we remove pressure for, from them, like slow down our fishing a little bit, uh, stop um, altering habitat quite as much and, and let them recover, they, they do. Uh, and often faster than we may have thought, because so far anyway, there have been relatively few extinctions in the oceans and species are still there and and they have a chance to to recover if we give them the space. And so my my hope is there. Uh, I think what it will take in the coming decade is the political and public will to act on that opportunity to give the oceans the space they need to recover. And I think there seems to be accelerating interest towards doing that and, and progress towards making that happen. So. Where it will be in nine years, uh, it's hard to know exactly, but I I actually do truly believe we'll be in a better place than we are today in the oceans because of a lot of this um, trajectory that we're on right now. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Ben. I think it's, um, as you indicated, it's really fantastic uh, that it's such a large commitment uh, to improve the, the oceans. And I see already now a large uh, measuring campaign coming together. So these data get ex- accessible, which is quite important also for our calculations of the uh, ocean health. But also models getting better and so on. So we uh, get a better understanding of the large patterns of, of oceans and so on. So I think the indicate is a very important um, important uh, trajectory tool to, to get engaged in, in, in large scale um, ocean science and ocean management. Uh, and if you think specifically the Ocean Health Index or the Baltic Health Index now, how, how could these tools uh, contribute to to the UN decade actually becoming a success? 
I have two ideas there, but I'm curious Thorsten's perspective as well. Um, one is by pulling together all this information about where we are today in the state of, of ocean health globally, but in the Baltic as well, we see where there are key gaps in our understanding, where there is not enough information to really give us a, a good sense of um, how particular goals are doing relative to overall ocean health. So it helps create a blueprint for research and discovery in the coming decade that can help us improve our understanding of where uh, the ocean is and where it's headed in terms of ocean health. And then the second thing is really helping us track progress, right? That's what it's designed to do. The index is there to tell us year to year how we are doing and achieving our goals. And so as we progress through the decade, the Ocean Health Index will help tell us how well we are um, um, achieving our goals, how much progress we're making. And then of course, once we get to 2030, whether we've achieved those goals in the end. So I think both of those things are really valuable aspects of the Ocean Health Index. Um, towards guiding the decade of the ocean and then evaluating the success of what we try to achieve with it. A compliment from the Baltic Sea point of view. Um, I think we see it is an area which where we have lots of data. But for example, like contaminants, like the new emerging contaminants which come from these very functional sports jackets, for example, and stuff like that, are not monitored at the moment, or some of them are not, moni not monitored and so on. So I think these kind of data gaps can be nicely visualized by uh, by the um, ocean health index, but also that is uh, it's that the um, the ocean is managed, hopefully also locally or regional, um, using these kind of tools where you can together with stakeholders discuss show how uh, certain trends are going um, in these um, in these goals is it upward trend or downward trend. So it shows already a kind of an early warning signal for certain managers. So I think that's uh, this kind of uh, very, very positive thing the uh, the ocean health index can can deliver. So um, so I think it would be a very very operational tool also where we can improve our oceans, but also improve science and understanding of how our ocean works in a more social ecological system way. Thank you. And it really seems like the key is the describing the interactions between the social and ecological and, and now also adding the social aspects a bit more strongly than traditionally. Um, am I correct there? That yeah, that's absolutely. one of the strengths yeah. Yeah. of the index. Yeah. Yeah. So we are unfortunately heading towards the end of this podcast. Um, but I have one final question to both of you, an important question. And uh, maybe, Ben, you can go first. Uh, what is the most important thing you, me, and all the listeners we have can do to help our oceans? I guess I would say just to pay attention, learn, and, and care about the oceans, right? Because there's not going to be one single simple solution because there's not one single simple problem that's facing the oceans. So to really make a difference for the health of the ocean and the future of our interaction with the ocean, we have to care. We have to pay attention learn about what we're doing and care about it and make and use that attention and care to begin to make a difference in our own actions in our community. So that's that's what I would say. And Torsten, I'm, I'm sure you have something to add. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just uh, just thinking what, what that could be. I, I think I think absolutely it is care and, um, uh, and, and also enjoy the ocean, uh, be there, observe what's going on there. Um, Maybe part in citizen science project, for example, where you report maybe invasive species or stuff like that, which you see in the ocean, make some some pictures and send it to others and ask what that is. But also uh, have a um, sustainable life. So uh, reduce as much plastic, maybe be engaged. And uh, for example, the Baltic Sea, they're quite, quite interesting engagement where you can uh, a lot of people cleaning beaches from trash and, and stuff like that. So I think. These are all things uh, which are important. And I agree with Ben, it's not a single solution which helps there. So it's, uh, if we all do different things, we will come to a better ocean in the future. Wise words. Uh, ben Thorsten, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights on the ocean health, ocean sustainability today. Uh, we wish you the best of luck and really look forward to follow your work on restoring the health of our oceans. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks for enjoying. You have listened to Rethink Talks, a podcast developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. For more episodes, head over to our website, rethink.earth. And don't forget to subscribe.